A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book the Second, The Golden Thread. Chapter Seven, Monseigneur in Town. Monseigneur, one of the great lords in power at the court, held his fortnightly reception in his grand hotel in Paris. Monseigneur was in his inner room, his sanctuary of sanctuaries, the holiest of holiests, to the crowd of worshippers in the suite of rooms without. Monseigneur was about to take his chocolate. Monseigneur could swallow a great many things with ease, and was by some few sullen minds supposed to be rather rapidly swallowing France. But his morning's chocolate could not so much as get into the throat of Monseigneur without the aid of four strong men besides the cook. Yes, it took four men, all four ablaze with gorgeous decoration, and the chief of them unable to exist with fewer than two gold watches in his pocket, emulative of the noble and chaste fashion set by Monseigneur, to conduct the happy chocolate to Monseigneur's lips. One lackey carried the chocolate pot into the sacred presence, a second milled and frothed the chocolate with the little instrument he bore for that function, a third presented the favoured napkin, a fourth, he of the two gold watches, poured the chocolate out. It was impossible for Monseigneur to dispense with one of these attendants on the chocolate and hold his high place under the admiring heavens. Deep would have been the blot upon his escutcheon if his chocolate had been ignobly waited on by only three men. He must have died of two. Monseigneur had been out at a little supper last night, where the comedy and the grand opera were charmingly represented. Monseigneur was out at a little supper most nights, with fascinating company. So polite and so impressible was Monseigneur, that the comedy and the grand opera had far more influence with him in the tiresome articles of state affairs and state secrets than the needs of all France. A happy circumstance for France, as the like always is for all countries similarly favoured, always was for England, by way of example, in the regretted days of the merry Stuart, who sold it. Monseigneur had one truly noble idea of general public business, which was to let everything go on in its own way. Of particular public business, Monseigneur had the other truly noble idea, that it must all go his way, tend to his own power and pocket. Of his pleasures, general and particular, Monseigneur had the other truly noble idea, that the world was made for them. The text of his order, altered from the original by only a pronoun, which is not much, ran, The earth and the fullness thereof are mine, saith Monseigneur. Yet Monseigneur had slowly found that the vulgar embarrassments crept into his affairs, both private and public, and he had, as to both classes of affairs, allied himself perforce with a farmer-general, as to finances public because monseigneur could not make anything at all of them and must consequently let them out to somebody who could as to finances private because farmers general were rich and monseigneur after generations of great luxury and expense was growing poor Hence, Monseigneur had taken his sister from a convent. While there was yet time to ward off the impending veil, the cheapest garment she could wear, and had bestowed her as a prize upon a very rich farmer-general, poor in family. Which farmer-general, carrying an appropriate cane with a golden apple on the top of it, was now among the company in the outer rooms, much prostrated before by mankind, always excepting superior mankind of the blood of Monseigneur, who, his own wife included, looked down upon him with the loftiest contempt. A sumptuous man was the farmer-general. Thirty horses stood in his stables, twenty-four male domestics sat in his halls, six body-women waited on his wife. 
As one who pretended to do nothing but plunder and forage where he could, the farmer-general, howsoever his matrimonial relations conduced to social morality, was at least the greatest reality among the personages who attended at the hotel of Monseigneur that day. For the rooms, though a beautiful scene to look at, and adorned with every device of decoration that the taste and skill of the time could achieve, were, in truth, not a sound business, considered with any reference to the scarecrows in the rags and nightcaps elsewhere, and not so far off either, but that the watching towers of Notre Dame, almost equidistant from the two extremes, could see them both they would have been an exceedingly uncomfortable business if that could have been anybody's business at the house of monseigneur military officers destitute of military knowledge naval officers with no idea of a ship civil officers without a notion of affairs brazen ecclesiastics of the worst world worldly with sensual eyes loose tongues and looser lives all totally unfit for their several callings all lying horribly in pretending to belong to them but all nearly or remotely of the order of monseigneur and therefore foisted on all public employments from which anything was to be got these were to be told off by the score and the score people not immediately connected with monseigneur or the state yet equally unconnected with anything that was real or with lives passed in travelling by any straight road to any true earthly end were no less abundant doctors who made great fortunes out of dainty remedies for imaginary disorders that never existed smiled upon their courtly patients in the antechambers of monseigneur projectors who had discovered every kind of remedy for the little evils with which the state was touched except the remedy of setting to work in earnest to root out a single sin poured their distracting babble into any ears they could lay hold of at the reception of monseigneur unbelieving philosophers who were remodelling the world with words and making card towers of babel to scale the skies with talked with unbelieving chemists who had an eye on the transmutation of metals at this wonderful gathering accumulated by monseigneur exquisite gentlemen of the finest breeding which was at that remarkable time and has been since to be known by its fruits of indifference to every natural subject of human interest were in the most exemplary state of exhaustion at the hotel of monseigneur such homes had these various notabilities left behind them in the fine world of paris that the spies among the assembled devotees of monseigneur forming a goodly half of the polite company would have found it hard to discover among the angels of that sphere one solitary wife who in her manners and appearance owned to being a mother indeed except for the mere act of bringing a troublesome creature into the world which does not go far towards the realization of the name of mother there was no such thing known to the fashion peasant women kept the unfashionable babies close and brought them up and charming grandmamas of sixty dressed and supped as at twenty the leprosy of unreality disfigured every human creature in attendance upon monseigneur in the outermost room were half a dozen exceptional people who had had for a few years some vague misgivings in them that things in general were going rather wrong as a promising way of setting them right half of the half-dozen had become members of a fantastic sect of convulsionists and were even then considering within themselves whether they should foam rage roar and turn cataleptic on the spot thereby setting up a highly intelligible finger-post to the future for monseigneur's guidance besides these dervishes were other three who had rushed into another sect which mended matters with a jargon about the centre of truth holding that man had got out of the centre of truth 
which did not need much demonstration, but had not got out of the circumference, and that he was to be kept from flying out of the circumference, and was even to be shoved back into the centre by fasting and seeing of spirits. Amongst these, accordingly, much discoursing with spirits went on, and it did a world of good which never became manifest. But the comfort was that all the company at the Grand Hotel of Monseigneur were perfectly dressed. If the Day of Judgment had only been ascertained to be a dress day, everybody there would have been eternally correct. Such frizzling and powdering and sticking up of hair, such delicate complexions artificially preserved and mended, such gallant swords to look at, and such delicate honour to the sense of smell, would surely keep anything going for ever and ever. The exquisite gentlemen of the finest breeding wore little pendant trinkets that chinked as they languidly moved. These golden fetters rang like precious little bells, and what with that ringing, and with the rustle of silk and brocade and fine linen, there was a flutter in the air that fanned San Antoine and his devouring hunger far away dress was the one unfailing talisman and charm used for keeping all things in their places everybody was dressed for a fancy ball that was never to leave off from the palace of the tuileries through monseigneur and the whole court through the chambers the tribunals of justice and all society except the scarecrows the fancy ball descended to the common executioner who in pursuance of the charm was required to officiate frizzled powdered in a gold-laced coat pumps and white silk stockings at the gallows and the wheel the axe was a rarity m parry as it was the episcopal mode among his brother's professors of the provinces m orleans and the rest to call him presided in this dainty dress and who among the company at monseigneur's reception in that seventeen hundred and eightieth year of our lord could possibly doubt that a system rooted in a frizzled hangman powdered gold-laced pumped and white silk stockinged would see the very stars out monseigneur having eased his four men of their burdens and taken his chocolate caused the doors of the holiest of holiests to be thrown open and issued forth then what submission what cringing and fawning what civility what abject humiliation as to bowing down in body and spirit nothing in that way was left for heaven which may have been among other reasons why the worshippers of monseigneur never troubled it bestowing a word of promise here and a smile there a whisper on one happy slave and a wave of the hand on another monseigneur affably passed through his rooms to the remote region of the circumference of truth there monseigneur turned and came back again and so in due course of time got himself shut up in his sanctuary by the chocolate sprites and was seen no more the show being over the flutter in the air became quite a little storm and the precious little bells went ringing downstairs there was soon but one person left of all the crowd and he with his hat under his arm and his snuff-box in his hand slowly passed among the mirrors on his way out i devote you said this person stopping at the last door on his way and turning in the direction of the sanctuary to the devil with that he shook the snuff from his fingers as if he had shaken the dust from his feet and quietly walked downstairs he was a man of about sixty handsomely dressed haughty in manner and with a face like a fine mask a face of a transparent paleness every feature in it clearly defined one set expression on it the nose beautifully formed otherwise was very slightly pinched at the top of each nostril 
In those two compressions, or dints, the only little change that the face ever showed resided. They persisted in changing colour sometimes, and they would be occasionally dilated and contracted by something like a faint pulsation. Then they gave a look of treachery and cruelty to the whole countenance. Examined with attention, its capacity of helping such a look was to be found in the line of the mouth, and the lines of the orbits of the eyes being much too horizontal and thin. Still, in the effect of the face made, it was a handsome face, and a remarkable one. Its owner went downstairs into the courtyard, got into his carriage, and drove away. Not many people had talked with him at the reception. He had stood in a little space apart, and Monseigneur might have been warmer in his manner. It appeared under the circumstances rather agreeable to him to see the common people dispersed before his horses, and often barely escaping from being run down. His man drove as if he were charging an enemy, and the furious recklessness of the man brought no check into the face or to the lips of the master. The complaint had sometimes made itself audible, even in that deaf city and dumb age, that, in the narrow streets without footways, the fierce patrician custom of hard driving endangered and maimed the mere vulgar in a barbarous manner. But few cared enough for that to think of it a second time, and in this matter, as in all others, the common wretches were left to get out of their difficulties as they could. With a wild rattle and clatter, and an inhuman abandonment of consideration not easy to be understood in these days, the carriage dashed through streets and swept round corners, with women screaming before it, and men clutching each other and clutching children out of its way. At last, swooping at a street corner by a fountain, one of its wheels came to a sickening little jolt, and there was a loud cry from a number of voices, and the horses reared and plunged. But for the latter inconvenience, the carriage probably would not have stopped. Carriages were often known to drive on and leave their wounded behind, and why not? but the frightened valet had got down in a hurry, and there were twenty hands at the horses' bridles. "'What has gone wrong?' said Monsieur, calmly looking out. A tall man in a nightcap had caught up a bundle from among the feet of the horses, and had laid it on the basement of the fountain, and was down in the mud and wet, howling over it like a wild animal. "'Pardon, Monsieur the Marquis,' said a ragged and submissive man, "'it is a child.' "'Why does he make that abominable noise? Is it his child?' "'Excuse me, Monsieur the Marquis, it is a pity, yes.' The fountain was a little removed, for the street opened, where it was, into a space some ten or twelve yards square. As the tall man suddenly got up from the ground, and came running at the carriage, Monsieur the Marquis clapped his hand for an instant on his sword-hilt. "'Killed!' shrieked the man in wild desperation, extending both arms at their length above his head, and staring at him. Dead. The people closed round and looked at Monsieur the Marquis. There was nothing revealed by the many eyes that looked at him but watchfulness and eagerness. There was no visible menacing or anger. Neither did the people say anything. After the first cry they had been silent, and they remained so. The voice of the submissive man who had spoken was flat and tame in its extreme submission. Monsieur the Marquis ran his eyes over them all, as if they had been mere rats come out of their holes. He took out his purse. "'It is extraordinary to me,' said he, "'that you people cannot take care of yourselves and your children. One or the other of you is for ever in the way. How do I know what injury you have done my horses? See, give him that.' He threw out a gold coin for the valet to pick up, and all the heads craned forward that all the eyes might look down at it as it fell. The tall man called out again with a most unearthly cry, "'Dead!' He was arrested by the quick arrival of another man for whom the rest made way. On seeing him, the miserable creature fell upon his shoulder, sobbing and crying and pointing to the fountain, where some women were stooping over the motionless bundle and moving gently about it. 
They were as silent, however, as the men. "'I know all, I know all,' said the last comer. "'Be a brave man, my Gaspar. "'It is better for the poor little plaything to die so than to live. "'It has died in a moment without pain. "'Could it have lived an hour as happily?' "'You're a philosopher, you there,' said the Marquis, smiling. "'How do they call you?' "'They call me Defarge. "'Of what trade?' "'Monsieur the Marquis, vendor of wine.' "'Pick up that philosopher and vendor of wine,' said the Marquis, throwing him another gold coin, "'and spend it as you will. The horse is there, but they write. Without deigning to look at the assemblage a second time, Monsieur the Marquis leaned back in his seat, and was just being driven away with the air of a gentleman who had accidentally broke some common thing and had paid for it, and could afford to pay for it, when his ease was suddenly disturbed by a coin flying into his carriage and ringing on its floor. "'Hold!' said Monsieur the Marquis. "'Hold the horses! Who threw that?' He looked to the spot where Defarge the vendor of wine had stood a moment before, but the wretched father was grovelling on his face on the pavement in that spot, and the figure that stood beside him was the figure of a dark, stout woman knitting. "'You dogs!' said the Marquis, but smoothly, and with an unchanged front, except as to the spots on his nose. "'I would ride over any of you very willingly and exterminate you from the earth, if I knew which rascal threw at the carriage, and if that brigand were sufficiently near it, he should be crushed under the wheels. So cowed was their condition, and so long and hard their experience of what such a man could do to them, within the law and beyond it, that not a voice, or a hand, or even an eye, was raised. Among the men not one. But the woman who stood knitting looked up steadily, and looked the Marquis in the face. It was not for his dignity to notice it, his contemptuous eyes passed over her, and over all the other rats, and he leaned back in his seat again and gave the word, "'Go on!' He was driven on, and other carriages came whirling by in quick succession. The minister, the state projector, the farmer-general, the doctor, the lawyer, the ecclesiastic, the grand opera, the comedy, the whole fancy ball in a bright continuous flow came whirling by. The rats had crept out of their holes to look on, and they remained looking on for hours, soldiers and police often passing between them and the spectacle, and making a barrier behind which they slunk and through which they peeped. The father had long ago taken up his bundle and bidden himself away with it, when the women who had tended the bundle while it lay on the base of the fountain sat there, watching the running of the water and the rolling of the fancy ball, when the one woman, who had stood conspicuous, knitting, still knitted on with the steadfastness of fate. The water of the fountain ran, the swift river ran, the day ran into evening. So much life in the city ran into death, according to rule. Time and tide waited for no man. The rats were sleeping close together in their dark holes again. The fancy ball was lighted up at supper. All things ran their course. End of Book Two, Chapter Seven A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book the Second, The Golden Thread Chapter 8, Monseigneur in the Country A beautiful landscape, with the corn bright in it, but not abundant. Patches of poor rye, where corn should have been. Patches of poor peas and beans. Patches of most coarse vegetable substitutes for wheat. On inanimate nature, as on the men and women who cultivated it, a prevalent tendency towards an appearance of vegetating unwillingly, a dejected disposition to give up and wither away. Monsieur the Marquis, in his travelling carriage, which might have been lighter, conducted by four post-horses and two postilions, fagged up a steep hill. A blush on the countenance of Monsieur the Marquis was no impeachment of his high breeding. It was not from within. It was occasioned by an external circumstance beyond his control, the setting sun. 
the sunset struck so brilliantly into the travelling carriage when it gained the hilltop that its occupant was steeped in crimson it will die out said monsieur the marquis glancing at his hands directly in effect the sun was so low that it dipped at the moment when the heavy drag had been adjusted to the wheel and the carriage slid downhill with a cinderous smell in a cloud of dust the red glow departed quickly the sun and the marquis going down together there was no glow left when the drag was taken off but there remained a broken country bold and open a little village at the bottom of the hill a broad sweep and rise beyond it a church tower a windmill a forest for the chase and a crag with a fortress on it used as a prison round upon all these darkening objects as the night drew on the marquis looked with the air of one who was coming near home the village had its one poor street with its poor brewery poor tannery poor tavern poor stable-yard for relays of post-horses poor fountains all usual poor appointments it had its poor people too all its people were poor and many of them were sitting at their doors shredding spare onions and the like for supper while many were at the fountain washing leaves and grasses and any such small yieldings of the earth that could be eaten expressive sips of what made them poor were not wanting the tax for the state the tax for the church the tax for the lord tax local and tax general were to be paid here and to be paid there according to solemn inscription in the little village until the wonder was that there was any village left unswallowed few children were to be seen and no dogs as to the men and women their choice on earth was stated in the prospect life on the lowest terms that could sustain it down in the little village under the mill or captivity and death in the dominant prison on the crag heralded by a courier in advance and by the cracking of his postilions whips which twined snake-like about their heads in the evening air as if he came attended by the furies monsieur the marquis drew up in his travelling carriage at the posting-house gate it was hard by the fountain and the peasants suspended their operations to look at him he looked at them, and saw in them, without knowing it, the slow, sure filing down of misery-worn face and figure that was to make the meagreness of Frenchmen an English superstition which should survive the truth through the best part of a hundred years. Monsieur the Marquis cast his eyes over the submissive faces that drooped before him, as the like of himself had drooped before Monseigneur of the Court, only the difference was that these faces drooped merely to suffer and not to propitiate, when a grizzled mender of the roads joined the group. "'Bring me hither that fellow,' said the Marquis to the courier. The fellow was brought cap in hand and the other fellows closed round to look and listen in the manner of the people at the paris fountain i passed you on the road monseigneur it is true i had the honour of being passed on the road coming up the hill and at the top of the hill both monseigneur it is true well, what did you look at so fixedly monseigneur i looked at the man he stooped a little, and with his tattered blue cap pointed under the carriage. All his fellows stooped to look under the carriage. "'What man, pig, and why look there?' "'Pardon, Monseigneur, he swung by the chain of the shoe, the drag.' "'Who?' demanded the traveller. "'Monseigneur, the man.' may the devil carry away these idiots how do you call the man you know all the men of this part of the country who was he your clemency monseigneur he was not of this part of the country of all the days of my life i never saw him swinging by the chain to be suffocated with your gracious permission that was the wonder of it monseigneur his head hanging over like this he turned himself sideways to the carriage and leaned back, with his face thrown up to the sky and his head hanging down, then recovered himself, fumbled with his cap, and made a bow. "'What was he like?' 
monseigneur he was whiter than the miller all covered with dust white as a spectre tall as a spectre the picture produced an immense sensation in the little crowd but all eyes without comparing notes with other eyes looked at monsieur the marquis perhaps to observe whether he had any spectre on his conscience truly you did well said the marquis felicitously sensible that such vermin were not to ruffle him to see a thief accompanying my carriage and not open that great mouth of yours bah put him aside monsieur gabel monsieur gabel was the postmaster and some other taxing functionary united he had come out with great obsequiousness to assist at this examination and had held the examined by the drapery of his arm in an official manner bah go aside said monsieur gabel lay hands on the stranger if he seeks to lodge in your village to-night and be sure that his business is honest gabel monseigneur i am flattered to devote myself to your orders did he run away fellow where is that accursed the accursed was already under the carriage with some half-dozen particular friends pointing out the chain with his blue cap some half-dozen other particular friends promptly hauled him out and presented him breathless to monsieur the marquis did the man run away dolt when we stopped for the drag monseigneur he precipitated himself over the hillside head first as a person plunges into the river see to it gabel go on the half-dozen who were peering at the chain were still among the wheels like sheep. The wheels turned so suddenly that they were lucky to save their skins and bones. They had very little else to save, or they might not have been so fortunate. The burst with which the carriage started out of the village and up the rise beyond was soon checked by the steepness of the hill. Gradually it subsided to a foot-pace, swinging and lumbering upward among the many sweet scents of a summer night the postilions with a thousand gossamer gnats circling about them in lieu of the furies quietly mended the points to the lashes of their whips the valet walked beside the horses the courier was audible trotting on ahead into the dun distance at the steepest point of the hill there was a little burial ground with a cross and a new large figure of our saviour on it it was a poor figure in wood done by some inexperienced rustic carver but he had studied the figure from the life his own maybe for it was dreadfully spare and thin to this distressful emblem of a great distress that had long been growing worse and was not at its worst a woman was kneeling she turned her head as the carriage came up to her rose quickly and presented herself at the carriage door it is you monseigneur monseigneur a petition with an exclamation of impatience but with his unchangeable face monseigneur looked out how then what is it always petitions monseigneur for the love of the great god my husband the forester what of your husband the forester always the same with you people he cannot pay something he has paid all monseigneur he is dead well he is quiet can i restore him to you alas no monseigneur but he lies yonder under a little heap of poor grass well monseigneur there are so many little heaps of poor grass again well she looked an old woman but was young her manner was one of passionate grief by turns she clasped her veinous and knotted hands together with wild energy and laid one of them on the carriage door tenderly caressingly as if it had been a human breast and could be expected to feel the appealing touch monseigneur hear me monseigneur hear my petition my husband died of a want so many die of want so many more will die of want again well can i feed them monseigneur the good god knows but i don't ask it 
my petition is that a morsel of stone or wood with my husband's name may be placed over him to show where he lies otherwise the place will be quickly forgotten it will never be found when i am dead of the same malady i shall be laid under some other heap of poor grass monseigneur there are so many they increase so fast there is so much want monseigneur monseigneur the valet had put her away from the door the carriage had broken into a brisk trot the postilions had quickened the pace she was left far behind and monseigneur again escorted by the furies was rapidly diminishing the league or two of distance that remained between him and his chateau the sweet scents of the summer night rose all around them and rose as the rain falls impartially on the dusty ragged and toil-worn group at the fountain not far away to whom the mender of roads with the aid of the blue cap without which he was nothing still enlarged upon his man like a spectre as long as they could bear it by degrees as they could bear no more they dropped off one by one and lights twinkled in little casements which lights as the casements darkened and more stars came out seemed to have shot up into the sky instead of having been extinguished the shadow of a large high-roofed house and of many overhanging trees was upon monsieur the marquis by that time and the shadow was exchanged for the light of a flambeau as his carriage stopped and the great door of his chateau was opened to him monsieur charles whom i expect has he arrived from england monseigneur not yet End of Book 2, Chapter 8 A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book the Second, The Golden Thread Chapter 9, The Gorgon's Head It was a heavy mass of building, that chateau of Monsieur the Marquis, with a large stone courtyard before it, and two stone sweeps of staircase meeting in a stone terrace before the principal door a stony business altogether with heavy stone balustrades and stone urns and stone flowers and stone faces of men and stone heads of lions in all directions as if the gorgon's head had surveyed it when it was finished two centuries ago up the broad flight of shallow steps monsieur the marquis flambeau preceded went from his carriage sufficiently disturbing the darkness to elicit loud remonstrance from an owl in the roof of the great pile of stable building away among the trees all else was so quiet that the flambeau carried up the steps and the other flambeau held at the great door burnt as if they were in a close room of state instead of being in the open night air other sound than the owl's voice there was none save the falling of a fountain into its stone basin for it was one of those dark nights that hold their breath by the hour together and then heave a long low sigh and hold their breath again the great door clanged behind him and monsieur the marquis crossed a hall grim with a certain old boar spears swords and knives of the chase grimmer with certain heavy riding rods and riding whips of which many a peasant gone to his benefactor death had felt the weight when his lord was angry avoiding the larger rooms which were dark and made fast for the night monsieur the marquis with his flambeau bearer going on before went up the staircase to a door in a corridor this thrown open admitted him to his own private apartment of three rooms his bedchamber and two others high vaulted rooms with cool uncarpeted floors great dogs upon the hearths for the burning of wood in winter time and all luxuries befitting the state of a marquis in a luxurious age and country the fashion of the last louis but one of the line that was never to break the fourteenth louis was conspicuous in their rich furniture but it was diversified by many objects that were illustrations of old pages in the history of france 
a supper-table was laid for two in the third of the rooms a round room in one of the chateau's four extinguisher-topped towers a small lofty room with its window wide open and the wooden jalousy blinds closed so that the dark night only showed in slight horizontal lines of black alternating with their broad lines of stone colour my nephew said the marquis glancing at the supper preparation they said he was not arrived nor was he but he had been expected with monseigneur ah it is not probable he will arrive to-night nevertheless leave the table as it is i shall be ready in a quarter of an hour in a quarter of an hour monseigneur was ready and sat down alone to his sumptuous and choice supper his chair was opposite to the window and he had taken his soup and was raising his glass of bordeaux to his lips when he put it down what is that he calmly asked looking with attention at the horizontal lines of black and stone colour monseigneur that outside the blinds open the blinds it was done well monseigneur it is nothing the trees and the night are all that are here the servant who spoke had thrown the blinds wide had looked out into the vacant darkness and stood with that blank behind him looking round for instructions good said the imperturbable master close them again that was done too and the marquis went on with his supper he was half way through it when he again stopped with his glass in his hand hearing the sound of wheels it came on briskly and came up to the front of the chateau ask who is arrived it was the nephew of monseigneur he had been some few leagues behind monseigneur early in the afternoon he had diminished the distance rapidly but not so rapidly as to come up with monseigneur on the road he had heard of monseigneur at the posting-houses as being before him he was to be told said monseigneur that supper awaited him then and there and that he was prayed to come to it in a little while he came he had been known in england as charles darnay monseigneur received him in a courtly manner but they did not shake hands you left paris yesterday sir he said to monseigneur as he took his seat at table yesterday and you i come direct from london yes you have been a long time coming said the marquis with a smile on the contrary i come direct pardon me i mean not a long time on the journey a long time intending the journey i have been detained by the nephew stopped a moment in his answer various business without doubt said the polished uncle so long as the servant was present no other words passed between them when coffee had been served and they were alone together the nephew looking at the uncle and meeting the eyes with a face that was like a fine mask opened a conversation i have come back sir as you anticipate pursuing the object that took me away it carried me into great and unexpected peril but it is a sacred object and if it had carried me to death i hope it would have sustained me not to death said the uncle it is not necessary to say to death i doubt sir returned the nephew whether if it had carried me to the utmost brink of death you would have cared to stop me there the deepened marks in the nose and the lengthening of the fine straight lines in the cruel face looked ominous as to that the uncle made a graceful gesture of protest which was so clearly a slight form of good breeding that it was not reassuring indeed sir pursued the nephew for anything i know you may have expressly worked to give a more suspicious appearance to the suspicious circumstances that surrounded me no 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 said the uncle pleasantly but however that may be resumed the nephew glancing at him with deep distrust i know that your diplomacy would stop me by any means and would know no scruple as to means my friend i told you so said the uncle with a fine pulsation in the two marks do me the favour to recall that i told you so long ago i recall it 
"'Thank you,' said the Marquis, very sweetly indeed. His tone lingered in the air, almost like the tone of a musical instrument. "'In effect, sir,' pursued the nephew, "'I believe it to be at once your bad fortune, and my good fortune, "'that has kept me out of a prison in France here.' "'I do not quite understand,' returned the uncle, sipping his coffee. "'Dare I ask you to explain?' i believe that if you were not in disgrace with the court and had not been overshadowed by that cloud for years past a letter to cachet would have sent me to some fortress indefinitely it is possible said the uncle with great calmness for the honour of the family i could even resolve to incommode you to that extent and pray excuse me I perceive that, happily for me, the reception of the day before yesterday was, as usual, a cold one, observed the nephew. I would not say happily, my friend, returned the uncle, with refined politeness. I would not be sure of that. A good opportunity for consideration, surrounded by the advantages of solitude, might influence your destiny to far greater advantage than you influence it for yourself. "'But it is useless to discuss the question. "'I am, as you say, at a disadvantage. "'These little instruments of correction, "'these gentle aids to the power and honour of families, "'these slight favours that might so incommode you, "'are only to be obtained now by interest and importunity. "'They are sought by so many, "'and they are granted comparatively to so few. "'It used not to be so, "'but France in all such things is changed for the world us our not remote ancestors held the right of life and death over the surrounding vulgar from this room many such dogs have been taken out to be hanged in the next room my bedroom one fellow to our knowledge was poniarded on the spot for professing some insolent delicacy respecting his daughter his daughter we have lost many privileges a new philosophy has become the mode and the assertion of our station in these days might i do not go so far as to say would but might cause us real inconvenience all very bad and very bad the marquis took a gentle little pinch of snuff and shook his head as elegantly despondent as he could becomingly be of a country still containing himself that great means of regeneration we have so asserted our station both in the old time and in the modern time also said the nephew gloomily that i believe our name to be more detested than any name in france let us hope so said the uncle detestation of the high is the involuntary homage of the low there is not pursued the nephew in his former tone a face i can look at in all this country round about us which looks at me with any deference on it but the dark deference of fear and slavery a compliment said the marquis to the grandeur of the family, merited by the manner in which the family has sustained its grandeur. Ah! And he took another gentle little pinch of snuff, and lightly crossed his legs. But when the nephew, leaning an elbow on the table, covered his eyes thoughtfully and dejectedly with his hand, the fine mask looked at him sideways with a stronger concentration of keenness, closeness, and dislike than was comportable with its wearer's assumption of indifference. And repression is the only lasting philosophy. The dark deference of fear and slavery, my friend observed the marquis or keep the dogs obedient to the whip as long as this roof looking up to it shuts out the sky that might not be so long as the marquis supposed if a picture of the chateau as it was to be a very few years hence and of fifty like it as they too were to be a very few years hence could have been shown to him that night he might have been at a loss to claim his own from the ghastly fire-charred plunder-wrecked ruins as for the roof he vaunted he might have found that shutting out the sky in a new way to wit for ever from the eyes of the bodies into which its lead was fired out of the barrels of a hundred thousand muskets 
Meanwhile, said the Marquis, I will preserve the honour and repose of the family if you will not. But you must be fatigued. Shall we terminate our conference for the night? A moment more. An hour, if you please. Sir, said the nephew, we have done wrong, and we are reaping the fruits of wrong. We have done wrong, repeated the Marquis, with an inquiring smile, and delicately pointing first to his nephew, then to himself. Our family, our honourable family, whose honour is of so much account to both of us, in such different ways, even in my father's time we did a world of wrong, injuring every human creature who came between us and our pleasure, whatever it was. Why need I speak of my father's time, when it is equally yours? Can I separate my father's twin brother, joint inheritor, and next successor from himself? "'Death has done that,' said the Marquis. "'And has left me,' answered the nephew, "'bound to a system that is frightful to me, "'responsible for it, but powerless in it, "'seeking to execute the last request of my dear mother's lips, "'and obey the last look of my dear mother's eyes, "'which implored me to have mercy and to redress, "'and tortured by seeking assistance and power in vain.' "'Seeking them from me, my nephew,' said the Marquis, touching him on the breast with his forefinger. They were now standing by the hearth. "'You will for ever seek them in vain, be assured.' Every fine straight line in the clear whiteness of his face was cruelly, craftily, and closely compressed, while he stood looking quietly at his nephew, with his snuff-box in his hand. Once again he touched him on the breast, as though his finger were the fine point of a small sword, with which, in delicate finesse, he ran him through the body, and said, "'My friend, I will die, perpetuating the system under which I have lived.' When he had said it, he took a culminating pinch of snuff, and put his box in his pocket." "'Better to be a rational creature,' he added then, after ringing a small bell on the table, "'and accept your natural destiny. But you are lost, Monsieur Charles, I see.' "'This property and France are lost to me,' said the nephew sadly. "'I renounce them.' "'Are they both yours to renounce? France may be, but as the property, it is scarcely worth mentioning. But is it yet?' I had no intention, in the words I used, to claim it yet. If it passed to me from you to-morrow, which I have the vanity to hope is not probable, or twenty years hence, you do me too much honour, said the Marquis. Still, I prefer that supposition. I would abandon it, and live otherwise and elsewhere. It is little to relinquish. What is it but a wilderness of misery and ruin? Ha! said the Marquis, glancing round the luxurious room. To the eye it is fair enough here, but seen in its integrity, under the sky and by the daylight, it is a crumbling tower of waste, mismanagement, extortion, debt, mortgage, oppression, hunger, nakedness, and suffering. Ha! said the Marquis again, in a well-satisfied manner. If it ever becomes mine, it shall be put into some hands better qualified to free it slowly, if such a thing is possible, from the weight that drags it down, so that the miserable people who cannot leave it, and who have been long wrung to the last point of endurance, may, in another generation, suffer less. But it is not for me. There is a curse on it, and on all this land." "'And you,' said the uncle, "'forgive my curiosity, do you, under your new philosophy, graciously, intend to live?' "'I must do to live what others of my countrymen, even with nobility at their backs, may have to do some day. Work.' "'In England, for example?' Yes, the family honour, sir, is safe from me in this country. The family name can suffer from me in no other, for I bear it in no other. The ringing of the bell had called to the adjoining bedchamber to be lighted. 
It now shone brightly through the door of communication. The Marquis looked that way and listened for the retreating step of the valet. "'England is very attractive to you, seeing how indifferently you have prospered there,' he observed then, turning his calm face to his nephew with a smile. "'I have already said that for my prospering there I am sensible I may be indebted to you, sir. For the rest, it is my refuge.' They say, those boastful English, that it is the refuge of many. You know a compatriot who has found a refuge there, a doctor? Yes. With a daughter? Yes. Yes, said the Marquis. You are fatigued. Good night. As he bent his head in his most courtly manner, there was a secrecy in his smiling face, and he conveyed an air of mystery to those words, which struck the eyes and ears of his nephew forcibly. At the same time, the thin straight lines of the setting of the eyes, and the thin straight lips, and the markings in the nose, curved with a sarcasm that looked handsomely diabolic. Yes, repeated the Marquis. A doctor with a daughter. Yes, so commences the new philosophy. You are fatigued. Good night. It would have been of as much avail to interrogate any stone face outside the chateau as to interrogate that face of his. The nephew looked at him in vain in passing on to the door. Good night, said the uncle. I look to the pleasure of seeing you again in the morning. Good repose. Light Monsieur my nephew to his chamber there, and burn Monsieur my nephew in his bed, if you will, he added to himself, before he rang his little bell again, and summoned his valet to his own bedroom. The valet, come and gone, Monsieur the Marquis walked to and fro in his loose chamber robe, to prepare himself gently for sleep that hot, still night rustling about the room his softly slippered feet making no noise on the floor he moved like a refined tiger looking like some enhanced marquis of the impenitently wicked sort in story whose periodical change into tiger form was either just going off or just coming on he moved from end to end of his voluptuous bedroom looking again at the scraps of the day's journey that came unbidden into his mind the slow toil up the hill at sunset the setting sun the descent the mill the prison on the crag the little village in the hollow the peasants at the fountain and the mender of roads with his blue cap pointing out the chain under the carriage that fountain suggested the paris fountain the little bundle lying on the step the woman bending over it and the tall man with his arms up crying dead i am cool now said monsieur the marquis and may go to bed so leaving only one light burning on the large hearth he let his thin gauze curtains fall around him and heard the night break its silence with a long sigh as he composed himself to sleep the stone faces on the outer wall stared blindly at the black night for three heavy hours for three heavy hours the horses in the stables rattled at their racks the dogs barked and the owl made a noise with very little resemblance in it to the noise conventionally assigned to the owl by men poets but it is the obstinate custom of such creatures hardly ever to say what is set down for them for three heavy hours the stone faces of the chateau, lion and human, stared blindly at the night. Dead darkness lay on all the landscape. Dead darkness added its own hush to the hushing dust on all the roads. The burial place had got to the pass that its little heaps of poor grass were undistinguishable from one another the figure on the cross might have come down for anything that could be seen of it in the village taxes and taxed were fast asleep dreaming perhaps of banquets as the starved usually do and of ease and rest as the driven slave and the yoked ox may its lean inhabitants slept soundly and were fed and freed the fountain in the village flowed unseen and unheard and the fountain at the chateau dropped unseen and unheard both melting away like the minutes that were falling from the spring of time through three 
dark hours. Then the grey water of both began to be ghostly in the light, and the eyes of the stone faces of the chateau were opened. Lighter and lighter, until at last the sun touched the tops of the still trees and poured its radiance over the hill. In the glow the water of the chateau fountain seemed to turn to blood, and the stone faces crimsoned. The carol of the birds was loud and high, and on the weather-beaten sill of the great window of the bedchamber of Monsieur the Marquis one little bird sang its sweetest song with all its might at this the nearest stone face seemed to stare amazed and with open mouth and dropped under jaw looked awe-stricken now the sun was full up and movement began in the village casement windows opened crazy doors were unbarred and people came forth shivering chilled as yet by the new sweet air then began the rarely lightened toil of the day among the village population some to the fountain some to the fields men and women here to dig and delve men and women there to see to the poor livestock and lead the bony cows out to such pasture as could be found by the roadside in the church and at the cross a kneeling figure or two attendant on the latter prayers the lead cow trying for a breakfast among the weeds at its foot the chateau awoke later as became its quality but awoke gradually and surely first the lonely boar spears and knives of the chase had been reddened as of old then had gleamed trenchant in the morning sunshine now doors and windows were thrown open horses in their stables looked round over their shoulders at the light and freshness pouring in at doorways leaves sparkled and rustled at iron grated windows dogs pulled hard at their chains and reared impatient to be loosed all these trivial incidents belonged to the routine of life and the return of morning surely not so the ringing of the great bell of the chateau nor the running up and down the stairs nor the hurried figures on the terrace nor the booting and tramping here and there and everywhere nor the quick saddling of horses and riding away what winds conveyed this hurry to the grizzled mender of roads already at work on the hilltop beyond the village with his day's dinner not much to carry lying in a bundle that it was worth no crow's while to peck at on a heap of stones had the birds carrying some grains of it to a distance dropped one over him as they sow chance seeds whether or no the mender of roads ran on the sultry morning as if for his life down the hill knee-high in dust and never stopped till he got to the fountain all the people of the village were at the fountain standing about in their depressed manner and whispering low but showing no other emotions than grim curiosity and surprise the lead cows hastily brought in and tethered to anything that would hold them were looking stupidly on or lying down chewing the cud of nothing particularly repaying their trouble which they had picked up in their interrupted saunter some of the people of the chateau and some of those of the posting-house and all of the taxing authorities were armed more or less and were crowded on the other side of the little street in a purposeless way that was highly fraught with nothing already the mender of roads had penetrated into the midst of a group of fifty particular friends and was smiting himself in the breast with his blue cap what did all this portend and what portended the swift hoisting up of monsieur gabelle behind a servant on horseback and the conveying away of the said gabelle double laden though the horse was at a gallop like a new version of the german ballad of leonora it portended that there was one stone face too many up at the chateau the gorgon had surveyed the building again in the night and had added the one stone face wanting the stone face for which it had waited through about two hundred years it lay back on the pillow of monsieur the marquis it was like a fine mask suddenly startled made angry and petrified driven home into the heart of the stone figure attached to it was a knife 
round its hilt was a frill of paper on which was scrawled drive him fast to his tomb this from jacques end of book two chapter nine A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book the Second, The Golden Thread Chapter Ten, Two Promises More months to the number of twelve had come and gone, and Mr. Charles Darnay was established in England as a higher teacher of the French language, who was conversant with French literature. In this age he would have been a professor, in that age he was a tutor he read with young men who could find any leisure and interest for the study of a living tongue spoken all over the world and he cultivated a taste for its stores of knowledge and fancy he could write of them besides in sound english and render them into sound english such masters were not at that time easily found princes that had been and kings that were to be were not yet of the teacher class and no ruined nobility had dropped out of tellson's ledgers to turn cooks and carpenters as a tutor whose attainments made the student's way unusually pleasant and profitable and as an elegant translator who brought something to his work besides mere dictionary knowledge young mr darnay soon became known and encouraged he was well acquainted moreover with the circumstances of his country and those were of ever-growing interest so with great perseverance and untiring industry he prospered in london he had expected neither to walk on pavements of gold nor to lie on beds of roses if he had had any such exalted expectation he would not have prospered he had expected labour and he found it and he did it and made the best of it in this his prosperity consisted a certain portion of his time was passed at cambridge where he read with undergraduates as a sort of tolerated smuggler who drove a contraband trade in european languages instead of conveying greek and latin through the custom-house the rest of his time he passed in london now from the days when it was always summer in eden to these days when it is mostly winter in fallen latitudes the world of a man has invariably gone one way charles darnay's way the way of the love of a woman he had loved lucy manette from the hour of his danger he had never heard a sound so sweet and dear as the sound of her compassionate voice he had never seen a face so tenderly beautiful as hers when it was confronted with his own on the edge of the grave that had been dug for him but he had not yet spoken to her on the subject the assassination at the deserted chateau far away beyond the heaving water and the long long dusty roads the solid stone chateau which had itself become the mere mist of a dream had been done a year and he had never yet by so much as a single spoken word disclosed to her the state of his heart that he had his reasons for this he knew full well it was again a summer day when lately arrived in london from his college occupation he turned into the quiet corner in soho bent on seeking an opportunity of opening his mind to dr manette it was the close of the summer day and he knew lucy to be out with miss pross he found the doctor reading in his armchair at a window the energy which had at once supported him under his old sufferings and aggravated their sharpness had been gradually restored to him he was now a very energetic man indeed with great firmness of purpose strength of resolution and vigour of action in his recovered energy he was sometimes a little fitful and sudden as he had at first been in the exercise of his other recovered faculties but this had never been frequently observable and had grown more and more rare he studied much slept little sustained a great deal of fatigue with ease and was equably cheerful to him now entered charles darnay at sight of whom he laid aside his book and held out his hand charles darnay i rejoice to see you we have been counting on your return these three or four days past mr stryver and sidney carton were both here yesterday and both made you out to be more than due 
"'I am obliged to them for their interest in the matter,' he answered, a little coldly as to them, though very warmly as to the doctor. "'Miss Manette is well,' said the doctor, as he stopped short, "'and your return will delight us all. She has gone out on some household matters, but will soon be home. Dr. Manette, I knew she was from home. I took the opportunity of her being from home to beg to speak to you.' There was a blank silence. "'Yes,' said the doctor, with evident constraint. "'Bring your chair here and speak on.' He complied as to the chair, but appeared to find the speaking on less easy. "'I have had the happiness, Dr. Manette, of being so intimate here,' he at length began, "'for some year and a half, that I hope the topic on which I am about to touch may not—' he was stayed by the doctor's putting out his hand to stop him when he had kept it so a little while he said drawing it back is lucy the topic she is it is hard for me to speak of her at any time it is very hard for me to hear her spoken of in that tone of yours charles darnay it is a tone of fervent admiration true homage and deep love dr manette he said deferentially there was another blank silence before her father rejoined, "'I believe it. I do you justice. I believe it.' His constraint was so manifest, and it was so manifest, too, that it originated in an unwillingness to approach the subject, that Charles Darnay hesitated. "'Shall I go on, sir?' Another blank. "'Yes, go on. You anticipate what I would say, though you cannot know how earnestly I say it, how earnestly I feel it, without knowing my secret heart, and the hopes and fears and anxieties with which it has long been laden. Dear Dr. Manette, I love your daughter fondly, dearly, disinterestedly, devotedly. If ever there were love in the world, I love her. You have loved yourself. Let your old love speak for me. The doctor sat with his face turned away and his eyes bent on the ground. At the last words he stretched out his hand again, hurriedly, and cried, Not that, sir! Let that be! I adjure you! Do not recall that! His cry was so like a cry of actual pain that it rang in Charles Darnay's ears long after he had ceased. He motioned with the hand he had extended, and it seemed to be an appeal to Darnay to pause. The latter so received it, and remained silent. "'I ask your pardon,' said the doctor, in a subdued tone, after some moments. "'I do not doubt your loving Lucy. You may be satisfied of it.' He turned towards him in the chair, but did not look at him or raise his eyes. His chin dropped upon his hand, and his white hair overshadowed his face. "'Have you spoken to Lucy?' "'No.' "'Nor written?' "'Never.' "'It would be ungenerous to affect not to know that your self-denial is to refer to your consideration for her father. Her father thanks you.' He offered his hand, but his eyes did not go with it. "'I know,' said Darnay respectfully. "'How can I fail to know, Dr. Manette, I who have seen you together from day to day, that between you and Miss Manette there is an affection so unusual, so touching, so belonging to the circumstances in which it has been nurtured, that it can have few parallels, even in the tenderness between a father and child?' i know dr manette how can i fail to know that mingled with the affection and duty of a daughter who has become a woman there is in her heart towards you all the love and reliance of infancy itself i know that as in her childhood she had no parent so she is now devoted to you with all the constancy and fervour of her present years and character united to the trustfulness and attachment of the early days in which you were lost to her i know perfectly well that if you had been restored to her from the world beyond this life you could hardly be invested in her sight with a more sacred character than that in which you are always with her 
I know that when she is clinging to you, the hands of baby, girl and woman, all in one, around your neck. I know that in loving you, she sees and loves her mother at her own age, sees and loves you at my age, loves her mother broken-hearted, loves you through your dreadful trial and in your blessed restoration. I have known this night and day since I have known you in your home." Her father sat silent with his face bent down. His breathing was a little quickened, but he repressed all other signs of agitation. "'Dear Dr. Manette, always knowing this, always seeing her and you with this hallowed light about you, I have forborne, and forborne, as long as it was in the nature of man to do it. I have felt, and do even now feel, that to bring my love, even mine, between you, is to touch your history with something not quite so good as itself. But I love her. Heaven is my witness that I love her.' "'I believe it,' answered her father, mournfully. "'I have thought so before now. I believe it.' "'But do not believe,' said Darnay, upon whose ear the mournful voice struck with a reproachful sound, "'that if my fortune was so cast as that, being one day so happy as to make her my wife, I must at any time put any separation between her and you, I could or would breathe a word of what I now say.' besides that i should know it to be hopeless i should know it to be a baseness if i had any such possibility even at a remote distance of years harboured in my thoughts and hidden in my heart if it ever had been there if it ever could be there i could not now touch this honoured hand he laid his own upon it as he spoke no dear dr manette like you a voluntary exile from france like you driven from it by its distractions oppressions and miseries like you striving to live away from it by my own exertions and trusting in a happier future i look only to sharing your fortunes sharing your life and home and being faithful to you to the death not to divide with Lucy her privilege as your child, companion, and friend, but to come in aid of it, and bind her closer to you, if such a thing can be. His touch still lingered on her father's hand. Answering the touch for a moment, but not coldly, her father rested his hands upon the arms of his chair, and looked up for the first time since the beginning of the conference. A struggle was evidently in his face, a struggle with that occasional look which had a tendency in it to dark doubt and a dread. You speak so feelingly and so manfully, Charles Darnay, that I thank you with all my heart, and will open all my heart, or nearly so. Have you any reason to believe that Lucy loves you? None, as yet none. Is it the immediate object of this confidence that you may at once ascertain that, with my knowledge? Not even so. I might not have the hopefulness to do it for weeks. I might, mistaken or not mistaken, have that hopefulness to-morrow. Do you seek any guidance from me? I ask none, sir, but I have thought it possible that you might have it in your power, if you should deem it right, to give me some. Do you seek any promise from me? I do seek that. What is it? I well understand that without you I could have no hope. I well understand that, even if Miss Manette held me at this moment in her innocent heart, do not think I have the presumption to assume so much, I could retain no place in it against her love for her father. If that be so, do you see what, on the other hand, is involved in it? I understand equally well that a word from her father in any suitor's favour would outweigh herself and all the world. For which reason, Dr. Manette, said Darnay, modestly but firmly, I would not ask that word to save my life. I am sure of it, Charles Darnay, mysteries arise out of close love as well as out of wide division. In the former case they are subtle and delicate and difficult to penetrate. My daughter Lucy is, in this one respect, such a mystery to me. I can make no guess as to the state of her heart. 
"'May I ask, sir, if you think she is?' As he hesitated, her father supplied the rest. "'Is sought by any other suitor?' "'It is what I meant to say.' Her father considered a little before he answered. "'You have seen Mr. Carton here yourself. Mr. Stryver is here too occasionally. If it be at all, it can only be by one of these.' "'Or both,' said Darnay. "'I had not thought of both. I should not think either likely. You want a promise from me. Tell me what it is.' "'It is that if Miss Manette should bring to you at any time, on her own part, such a confidence as I have ventured to lay before you, you will bear testimony to what I have said, and to your belief in it. I hope you may be able to think so well of me as to urge no influence against me. I say nothing more of my stake in this. This is what I ask. The condition on which I ask it, and which you have an undoubted right to require, I will observe immediately. I give the promise, said the doctor, without any condition. I believe your object to be purely and truthfully as you have stated it. I believe your intention is to perpetuate, and not to weaken, the ties between me and my other and far dearer self. If she should ever tell me that you are essential to her perfect happiness, I will give her to you. If there were, Charles Darnay, if there were, the young man had taken his hand gratefully, their hands were joined as the doctor spoke, any fancies, any reasons, any apprehensions, anything whatsoever, new or old, against the man she really loved, the direct responsibility thereof not lying on his head, they should all be obliterated for her sake. She is everything to me, more to me than suffering, more to me than wrong, more to me... Well, this is idle talk. So strange was the way in which he faded into silence, and so strange his fixed look when he had ceased to speak, that Darnay felt his own hand turn cold in the hand that slowly released and dropped it. "'You said something to me,' said Dr. Manette, breaking into a smile. "'What was it you said to me?' He was at a loss how to answer, until he remembered having spoken of a condition. Relieved as his mind reverted to that, he answered, "'Your confidence in me ought to be returned with full confidence on my part. My present name, though but slightly changed from my mother's, is not, as you will remember, my own. I wish to tell you what that is, and why I am in England.' "'Stop!' said the doctor of Beauvais. I wish it that I may better deserve your confidence, and have no secret from you. Stop! For an instant the doctor even had his two hands at his ears, for another instant even had his two hands laid on Darnay's lips. Tell me when I ask you, not now. If your suit should prosper, if Lucy should love you, you shall tell me on your marriage morning. Do you promise? Willingly. "'Give me your hand. She will be home directly, and it is better she should not see us together to-night. Go. God bless you.' It was dark when Charles Darnay left him, and it was an hour later and darker when Lucy came home. She hurried into the room alone, for Miss Pross had gone straight upstairs, and was surprised to find his reading-chair empty. "'My father!' she called to him. "'Father, dear!' Nothing was said in answer, but she heard a low hammering sound in his bedroom. Passing lightly across the intermediate room, she looked in at his door, and came running back frightened, crying to herself, with her blood all chilled, "'What shall I do? What shall I do?' Her uncertainty lasted but a moment. She hurried back, and tapped at his door, and softly called to him. The noise ceased at the sound of her voice, and he presently came out to her, and they walked up and down together for a long time. She came down from her bed to look at him in his sleep that night. He slept heavily, and his tray of shoemaking tools, and his old unfinished work, were all as usual. End of Book 2, Chapter 10 A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book the Second, The Golden Thread Chapter 11, A Companion Picture 
Sidney, said Mr. Stryver, on that self-same night or morning to his jackal, mix another bowl of punch. I have something to say to you. Sidney had been working double tides that night, and the night before, and the night before that, and a good many nights in succession, making a grand clearance among Mr. Stryver's papers before the setting in of the long vacation. The clearance was effected at last, the Stryver arrears were handsomely fetched up, everything was got rid of until November should come with its fogs atmospheric and fogs legal, and bring grist to the mill again. Sidney was none the livelier, and none the soberer for so much application. It had taken a deal of extra wet toweling to pull him through the night, a correspondingly extra quantity of wine had preceded the toweling, and he was in a very damaged condition, as he now pulled his turban off and threw it into the basin, in which he had steeped it at intervals for the last six hours. "'Are you mixing that other bowl of punch?' said Stryver the portly, with his hands in his waistband, glancing round from the sofa where he lay on his back. "'I am. Now look here, I'm going to tell you something that will rather surprise you, and that perhaps will make you think me not quite as shrewd as you usually do think me. I intend to marry.' "'Do you?' "'Yes, and not for money. What do you say now?' I don't feel disposed to say much. Who is she? Guess. Do I know her? Guess. I'm not going to guess at five o'clock in the morning with my brains frying and sputtering in my head. If you want me to guess, you must ask me to dinner. Well, then I'll tell you, said Stryver, coming slowly into a sitting posture. Sidney, I rather despair of making myself intelligible to you, because you are such an insensible dog. And you, returned Sidney, busy concocting the punch, are such a sensitive and poetical spirit. Come, rejoined Stryver, laughing boastfully. Though I don't prefer any claim to being the soul of romance, for I hope I know better, still I am a tenderer sort of fellow than you. You are a luckier, if you mean that. I don't mean that. I mean I am a man of more, more... Say gallantry while you are about it, suggested Carton. Well, I'll say gallantry. My meaning is that I am a man, said Stryver, inflating himself at his friend as he made the punch, who cares more to be agreeable, who takes more pains to be agreeable, who knows better how to be agreeable in a woman's society than you do. Go on, said Sidney Carton. No, but before I go on, said Stryver, shaking his head in his bullying way, I'll have this out with you. You've been at Dr. Manette's house as much as I have, or more than I have. Why, I have been ashamed of your moroseness there. Your manners have been of that silent and sullen and hangdog kind. That, upon my life and soul, I've been ashamed of you, Sidney. It should be very beneficial to a man in your practice at the bar to be ashamed of anything, returned Sidney. You ought to be much obliged to me. You should not get off in that way, rejoined Stryver, shouldering the rejoinder at him. No, Sidney, it is my duty to tell you, and I tell you to your face to do you good, that you are a devilish ill-conditioned fellow in that sort of society. You are a disagreeable fellow. Sidney drank a bumper of the punch he had made, and laughed. "'Look at me!' said Stryver, squaring himself. "'I have less need to make myself agreeable than you have, being more independent in circumstances. Why do I do it?' "'I never saw you do it yet,' muttered Carton. "'I do it because it's politic. I do it on principle, and look at me! I get on!' "'You don't get on with your account of your matrimonial intentions,' answered Carton, with a careless air. "'I wish you would keep to that. As to me, will you never understand that I am incorrigible?' He asked the question with some appearance of scorn. "'You have no business to be incorrigible,' was his friend's answer, delivered in no very soothing tone. "'I have no business to be at all that I know of,' said Sidney Carton. "'Who is the lady?' 
"'Now, don't let my announcement of the name make you uncomfortable, Sidney,' said Mr. Stryver, preparing him with ostentatious friendliness for the disclosure he was about to make, "'because I know you don't mean half you say, and if you meant it all, it would be of no importance. I make this little preface because you once mentioned the young lady to me in slighting terms.' "'I did?' "'Certainly, and in these chambers.' Sidney Carton looked at his punch, and looked at his complacent friend, drank his punch, and looked at his complacent friend. "'You made mention of the young lady as a golden-haired doll. The young lady is Miss Manette. If you had been a fellow of any sensitiveness or delicacy of feeling in that kind of way, Sidney, I might have been a little resentful of your employing such a designation. But you are not. You want that sense altogether. Therefore I am no more annoyed when I think of the expression than I should be annoyed by a man's opinion of a picture of mine who had no eye for pictures, or of a piece of music of mine who had no ear for music. Sidney Carton drank the punch at a great rate, drank it by bumpers, looking at his friend. "'Now you know all about it, Sid,' said Mr. Stryver. "'I don't care about fortune. She is a charming creature, and I have made up my mind to please myself. On the whole, I think I can afford to please myself. She will have in me a man already pretty well off, and a rapidly rising man, and a man of some distinction. It is a piece of good fortune for her, but she is worthy of good fortune. Are you astonished?' Carton, still drinking the punch, rejoined, "'Why should I be astonished?' "'You approve?' Carton, still drinking the punch, rejoined, "'Why should I not approve?' "'Well,' said his friend Stryver, "'you take it more easily than I fancied you would, "'and you are less mercenary on my behalf than I thought you would be, "'though, to be sure, you know well enough by this time "'that your ancient chum is a man of a pretty strong will. "'Yes, Sidney, I have had enough of this style of life, "'with no other as a change from it. "'I feel that it is a pleasant thing for a man to have a home "'when he feels inclined to go to it. "'When he doesn't, he can stay away, "'and I feel that Miss Manette will tell well in any station "'and will always do me credit.' "'So I have made up my mind, and now, Sidney, old boy, I want to say a word to you about your prospects. You are in a bad way, you know. You really are in a bad way. You don't know the value of money. You live hard. You'll knock up one of these days and be ill and poor. You really ought to think about a nurse.' The prosperous patronage with which he said it made him look twice as big as he was and four times as offensive.' "'Now, let me recommend you,' pursued Stryver, "'to look it in the face. "'I have looked it in the face in my different way. "'Look it in the face, you, in your different way. "'Marry. "'Provide somebody to take care of you. "'Never mind your having no enjoyment of women's society, "'nor understanding of it, nor tact for it. "'Find out somebody. "'Find out some respectable woman with a little property, "'somebody in the landlady way or lodging-letting way, "'and marry her against a rainy day. "'That's the kind of thing for you. "'Now think of it, Sidney.' "'I'll think of it,' said Sidney. End of Book 2, Chapter 11 A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book the Second, The Golden Thread Chapter 12, The Fellow of Delicacy Mr. Stryver, having made up his mind to that magnanimous bestowal of good fortune on the doctor's daughter, resolved to make her happiness known to her before he left town for the long vacation. After some mental debating of the point, he came to the conclusion that it would be as well to get all the preliminaries done with, and they could then arrange at their leisure whether he should give her his hand a week or two before Michaelmas term, or in the little Christmas vacation between it and Hilary. As to the strength of his case, he had not a doubt about it, but clearly saw his way to the verdict. 
argued with the jury on substantial worldly grounds the only grounds ever worth taking into account it was a plain case and had not a weak spot in it he called himself for the plaintiff there was no getting over his evidence the counsel for the defendant threw up his brief and the jury did not even turn to consider after trying it striver c j was satisfied that no plainer case could be accordingly mr striver inaugurated the long vacation with a formal proposal to take miss manette to vauxhall gardens that failing to ranelagh that unaccountably failing too it behoved him to present himself in soho and there declare his noble mind towards soho therefore mr striver shouldered his way from the temple while the bloom of the long vacation's infancy was still upon it anybody who had seen him projecting himself into soho while he was yet on st dunstan's side of temple bar bursting in his full-blown way along the pavement to the jostlement of all weaker people might have seen how safe and strong he was his way taking him past Telson's, and he both banking at Telson's, and knowing Mr. Lorry as the intimate friend of the Manettes, it entered Mr. Striver's mind to enter the bank and reveal to Mr. Lorry the brightness of the Soho horizon. So he pushed open the door with the weak rattle in its throat, stumbled down the two steps, got past the two ancient cashiers, and shouldered himself into the musty back closet where Mr. Lorry sat at great books ruled for figures, with perpendicular iron bars to his window, as if that were ruled for figures too, and everything under the clouds were a sum. "'Halloa!' said Mr. Striver. "'How do you do? I hope you are well.' It was Striver's grand peculiarity that he always seemed too big for any place or space. He was so much too big for Telson's that old clerks in distant corners looked up with looks of remonstrance, as though he squeezed them against the wall. The house itself, magnificently reading the paper quite in the far-off perspective, lowered displeased, as if the Striver head had been butted into its responsible waistcoat the discreet mr lorry said in a sample tone of the voice he would recommend under the circumstances how do you do mr striver how do you do sir and shook hands there was a peculiarity in his manner of shaking hands always to be seen in any clerk at telston's who shook hands with a customer when the house pervaded the air he shook in a self-abnegating way as one who shook for telston and company can i do anything for you mr striver asked mr lorry in his business character why no thank you this is a private visit to yourself mr lorry i have come for a private word oh indeed said mr lorry bending down his ear while his eye strayed to the house afar off i am going said mr striver leaning his arms confidentially on the desk whereupon although it was a large double one there appeared to be not half desk enough for him i am going to make an offer of myself in marriage to your agreeable little friend miss manette mr lorry oh dear me cried mr lorry rubbing his chin and looking at his visitor dubiously "'Oh, dear me, sir,' repeated Striver, drawing back. "'Oh, dear you, sir, what may your meaning be, Mr. Lorry?' "'My meaning,' answered the man of business, "'is, of course, friendly and appreciative, "'and that it does you the greatest credit, "'and, in short, my meaning is everything you could desire. "'But really, you know, Mr. Striver,' "'Mr. Lorry paused and shook his head at him in the oddest manner.' as if he were compelled against his will to add internally you know there really is so much too much of you well said striver slapping the desk with his contentious hand opening his eyes wider and taking a long breath if i understand you mr lorry i'll be hanged mr lorry adjusted his little wig at both ears as a means towards that end and bit the feather of a pen "'Damn it all, sir!' said Striver, staring at him. "'Am I not eligible?' "'Oh, dear, yes, yes, oh, yes, you're eligible,' said Mr. Lorry. "'If you say eligible, you are eligible.' "'Am I not prosperous?' asked Striver. "'Oh, if you come to prosperous, you are prosperous,' said Mr. Lorry. "'And advancing?' 
"'If you come to advancing, you know,' said Mr. Lorry, delighted to be able to make another admission, "'nobody can doubt that.' "'Then what on earth is your meaning, Mr. Lorry?' demanded Stryver, perceptibly crestfallen. "'Well, I—were you going then now?' asked Mr. Lorry. "'Straight!' said Stryver, with a plump of his fist on the desk. "'Then I think I wouldn't if I was you.' "'Why?' said Stryver. "'Now, I'll put you in a corner.' forensically shaking a forefinger at him. "'You are a man of business, and bound to have a reason. State your reason. Why wouldn't you go?' "'Because,' said Mr. Lorry, "'I wouldn't go on such an object without having some cause to believe that I should succeed.' "'Damn me!' cried Stryver. "'But this beats everything!' Mr. Lorry glanced at the distant house and glanced at the angry Stryver. "'Here's a man of business, a man of years, a man of experience, in a bank,' said Stryver, "'and having summed up three leading reasons for complete success, he says there's no reason at all, says it with his head on.' Mr. Stryver remarked upon the peculiarity, as if it would have been infinitely less remarkable if he had said it with his head off. "'When I speak of success, I speak of success with the young lady, and when I speak of causes and reasons to make success probable, I speak of causes and reasons that will tell as such with the young lady. The young lady, my good sir,' said Mr. Lorry, mildly tapping the striver arm, "'the young lady, the young lady goes before all.' "'Then you mean to tell me, Mr. Lorry?' said Stryver, squaring his elbows, that it is your deliberate opinion that the young lady at present in question is a mincing fool? Not exactly so. I mean to tell you, Mr. Stryver, said Mr. Lorry, reddening, that I will hear no disrespectful word of that young lady from any lips, and that if I knew any man, which I hope I do not, whose taste was so coarse, and whose temper was so overbearing, that he could not restrain himself from speaking disrespectfully of that young lady at this desk, not even Telson should prevent my giving him a piece of my mind. The necessity of being angry in a suppressed tone had put Mr. Stryver's blood vessels into a dangerous state when it was his turn to be angry. Mr. Lorry's veins, methodical as their courses could usually be, were in no better state now it was his turn. "'That is what I mean to tell you, sir,' said Mr. Lorry. "'Pray let there be no mistake about it.' Mr. Stryver sucked the end of a ruler for a little while, and then stood hitting a tune out of his teeth with it, which probably gave him the toothache. He broke the awkward silence by saying, "'This is something new to me, Mr. Lorry. You deliberately advise me not to go up to Soho and offer myself, myself, Stryver of the King's Bench Bar?' "'Do you ask me for my advice, Mr. Stryver?' "'Yes, I do.' "'Very good. Then I give it, and you have repeated it correctly. "'And all I can say of it is,' laughed Stryver with a vexed laugh, "'that this <laughs> beats everything, past, present, and to come.' "'Now understand me,' pursued Mr. Lorry. "'As a man of business, I am not justified in saying anything about this matter, "'for, as a man of business, I know nothing of it. "'But as an old fellow who has carried Miss Manette in his arms, "'who is the trusted friend of Miss Manette, and of her father too, "'and who has a great affection for them both, I have spoken. "'The confidence is not of my seeking, recollect. "'Now, you think I may not be right?' "'Not I,' said Stryver, whistling. "'I can't undertake to find third parties in common sense. "'I can only find it for myself. "'I suppose sense in certain quarters. "'You suppose mincing bread-and-butter nonsense. "'It's new to me, but you are right, I dare say.' "'What I suppose, Mr. Stryver, I claim to characterise for myself. "'And understand me, sir,' said Mr. Lorry, quickly flushing again. I will not, not even at Telson's, have it characterized for me by any gentleman breathing. There, I beg your pardon, said Stryver. Granted. Thank you.
Well, Mr. Stryver, I was about to say it might be painful to you to find yourself mistaken. It might be painful to Dr. Manette to have the task of being explicit with you. It might be very painful to Miss Manette to have the task of being explicit with you. You know the terms upon which I have the honour and happiness to stand with the family. If you please, committing you in no way, representing you in no way, I will undertake to correct my advice by the exercise of a little new observation and judgment expressly brought to bear upon it if you should then be dissatisfied with it you can but test its soundness for yourself if on the other hand you should be satisfied with it and it should be what it now is it may spare all sides what is best spared what do you say how long would you keep me in town oh it's only a question of a few hours I could go to Soho in the evening and come to your chambers afterwards. Then I say yes, said Stryver. I won't go up there now. I'm not so hot upon it as that comes to. I say yes, and I shall expect you to look in tonight. Good morning. Then Mr. Stryver turned and burst out of the bank, causing such a concussion of air on his passage through that to stand up against it bowing behind the two counters required the utmost remaining strength of the two ancient clerks. Those venerable and feeble persons were always seen by the public in the act of bowing, and were popularly believed, when they had bowed a customer out, still to keep on bowing in the empty office until they bowed another customer in. The barrister was keen enough to divine that the banker would not have gone so far in his expression of opinion on any less solid ground than moral certainty unprepared as he was for the large pill he had to swallow he got it down and now said mr stryver shaking his forensic forefinger at the temple in general when it was down my way out of this is to put you all in the wrong it was a bit of the art of an old bailey tactician in which he found great relief you shall not put me in the wrong young lady said mr stryver i'll do that for you accordingly when mr lorry called that night as late as ten o'clock mr stryver among a quantity of books and papers littered out for the purpose seemed to have nothing less on his mind than the subject of the morning he even showed surprise when he saw mr lorry and was altogether in an absent and preoccupied state well said that good-natured emissary after a full half-hour of bootless attempts to bring him round to the question i've been to soho to soho repeated mr stryver coldly oh to be sure what am i thinking of and i have no doubt said mr lorry that i was right in the conversation we had my opinion is confirmed and i reiterate my advice i assure you returned mr stryver in the friendliest way that i am sorry for it on your account and sorry for it on the poor father's account i know this must always be a sore subject with the family let us say no more about it i don't understand you said mr lorry i dare say not rejoined stryver nodding his head in a smoothing and final way no matter no matter but it does matter mr lorry urged no it doesn't i assure you it doesn't having supposed that there was sense where there is no sense and a laudable ambition where there is not a laudable ambition i am well out of my mistake and no harm is done young women have committed similar foibles often before and have repented them in poverty and obscurity often before in an unselfish aspect, I am sorry that the thing is dropped, because it would have been a bad thing for me in a worldly point of view. In a selfish aspect, I am glad that the thing is dropped, because it would have been a bad thing for me in a worldly point of view. It is hardly necessary to say I could have gained nothing by it. There is no harm at all done. I have not proposed to the young lady, and, between ourselves, I am by no means certain, on reflection, that I ever should have committed myself to that extent. Mr. Lorry, you cannot control the mincing vanities and giddiness of empty-headed girls. You must not expect to do it or you will always be disappointed now pray say no more about it i tell you i regret it on account of others but i am satisfied on my own account
and i am really very much obliged to you for allowing me to sound you and for giving me your advice you know the young lady better than i do you were right it never would have done mr lorry was so taken aback that he looked quite stupidly at mr stryver shouldering him towards the door with an appearance of showering generosity forbearance and good will on his erring head make the best of it my dear sir said stryver say no more about it thank you again for allowing me to sound you good night mr lorry was out in the night before he knew where he was mr stryver was lying back on his sofa winking at his ceiling end of book two chapter twelve a tale of two cities by charles dickens Book the Second, The Golden Thread. Chapter 13, The Fellow of No Delicacy. If Sidney Carton ever shone anywhere, he certainly never shone in the house of Dr. Manette. He had been there often, during a whole year, and had always been the same moody and morose lounger there. When he cared to talk, he talked well, but the cloud of caring for nothing, which overshadowed him with such a fatal darkness, was very rarely pierced by the light within him and yet he did care something for the streets that environed that house and for the senseless stones that made their pavements many a night he vaguely and unhappily wandered there when wine had brought no transitory gladness to him many a dreary daybreak revealed his solitary figure lingering there and still lingering there when the first beams of the sun brought into strong relief removed beauties of architecture in spires of churches and lofty buildings as perhaps the quiet time brought some sense of better things else forgotten and unattainable into his mind of late the neglected bed in the temple court had known him more scantily than ever and often when he had thrown himself upon it no longer than a few minutes he had got up again and haunted that neighbourhood on a day in august when mr stryver after notifying to his jackal that he had thought better of that marrying matter had carried his delicacy into devonshire and when the sight and scent of flowers in the city streets had some waifs of goodness in them for the worst of health for the sickliest and of youth for the oldest sidney's feet still trod those stones from being irresolute and purposeless his feet became animated by an intention and in the working out of that intention they took him to the doctor's door he was shown upstairs and found lucy at her work alone she had never been quite at her ease with him and received him with some little embarrassment as he seated himself near her table but looking up at his face in the interchange of the first few commonplaces she observed a change in it i fear you are not well mr carton no but the life i lead miss manette is not conducive to health what is to be expected of or by such profligates is it not for, forgive me i have begun the question on my lips a pity to live no better life god knows it is a shame then why not change it looking gently at him again she was surprised and saddened to see that there were tears in his eyes there were tears in his voice too as he answered it is too late for that i shall never be better than i am i shall sink lower and be worse he leaned an elbow on her table and covered his eyes with his hand the table trembled in the silence that followed she had never seen him softened and was much distressed he knew her to be so without looking at her and said pray forgive me miss manette i break down before the knowledge of what i want to say to you will you hear me it will do you any good mr carton if it would make you happier it would make me very glad god bless you for your sweet compassion he unshaded his face after a little while and spoke steadily don't be afraid to hear me don't shrink from anything i say i am like one who died young all my life might have been no mr carton i am sure that the best part of it might still be i am sure that you might be much much worthier of yourself 
say of you miss manette and although i know better although in the mystery of my own wretched heart i know better i shall never forget it she was pale and trembling he came to her relief with a fixed despair of himself which made the interview unlike any other that could have been holden if it had been possible miss manette that you could have returned the love of the man you see before you flung away wasted drunken poor creature of misuse as you know him to be he would have been conscious this day and hour in spite of his happiness that he would bring you to misery bring you to sorrow and repentance blight you disgrace you pull you down with him i know very well that you can have no tenderness for me i ask for none i am even thankful that it cannot be without it can i not save you mr carton can i not recall you forgive me again to a better course can i in no way repay your confidence i know this is a confidence she modestly said after a little hesitation and in earnest tears i know you would say this to no one else can i turn it to no good account for yourself mr carton he shook his head to none no miss manette to none if you will hear me through a very little more all you can ever do for me is done i wish you to know that you have been the last dream of my soul in my degradation i have not been so degraded but that the sight of you with your father and of this home made such a home by you has stirred old shadows that i thought had died out of me since i knew you i have been troubled by a remorse that i thought would never reproach me again and have heard whispers from old voices impelling me upward that i thought were silent for ever i have had unformed ideas of striving afresh beginning anew shaking off sloth and sensuality and fighting out the abandoned fight a dream all a dream that ends in nothing and leaves the sleeper where he lays down but i wish you to know that you inspired it will nothing of it remain oh mr carton think again try again no miss manette all through it i have known myself to be quite undeserving and yet i have had the weakness and have still the weakness to wish you to know with what a sudden mastery you kindled me heap of ashes that i am into fire a fire however inseparable in its nature from myself quickening nothing lighting nothing doing no service idly burning away since it is my misfortune mr carton to have made you more unhappy than you were before you knew me don't say that miss manette for you would have reclaimed me if anything could you will not be the cause of my becoming worse since the state of your mind that you describe is at all events attributable to some influence of mine this is what i mean if i can make it plain can i use no influence to serve you have i no power for good with you at all the utmost good that i am capable of now miss manette i have come here to realize let me carry through the rest of my misdirected life the remembrance that i opened my heart to you last of all the world and that there was something left in me at this time which you could deplore and pity which i entreated you to believe again and again most fervently with all my heart was capable of better things mr carton entreat me to believe it no more miss manette i have proved myself and i know better i distress you i draw fast to an end will you let me believe when i recall this day that the last confidence of my life was reposed in your pure and innocent breast and that it lies there alone and will be shared by no one if that will be a consolation to you yes not even by the dearest one ever to be known to you mr carton she answered after an agitated pause the secret is yours not mine and i promise to respect it thank you and again god bless you he put her hand to his lips and moved towards the door be under no apprehension miss manette of my ever resuming this conversation by so much as a passing word i would never refer to it again if i were dead that could not be surer than it is henceforth 
In the hour of my death I shall hold sacred the one good remembrance, and shall thank and bless you for it, that my last avowal of myself was made to you, and that my name and faults and miseries were gently carried in your heart, may it otherwise be light and happy. He was so unlike what he had ever shown himself to be, and it was so sad to think how much he had thrown away, and how much he every day kept down and perverted, that Lucy Manette wept mournfully for him as he stood looking back at her. "'Be comforted,' he said. "'I am not worth such feeling, Miss Manette. An hour or two hence, and the low companions and low habits that I scorn but yield to, will render me less worth such tears as those than any wretch who creeps along the streets. Be comforted. But within myself I shall always be towards you what I am now, though outwardly I shall be what you have heretofore seen me.' the last supplication but one i make to you is that you will believe this of me i will mr carton my last supplication of all is this and with it i will relieve you of a visitor with whom i well know you have nothing in unison and between whom and you there is an impassable space it is useless to say it i know but it rises out of my soul for you and any dear to you i would do anything if my career were of that better kind that there was any opportunity or capacity of sacrifice in it i would embrace any sacrifice for you and for those dear to you try to hold me in your mind some quiet times as ardent and sincere in this one thing the time will come the time will not be long in coming when new ties will be formed about you ties that will bind you yet more tenderly and strongly to the home you so adorn the dearest ties that will ever grace and gladden you oh miss manette when the little picture of a happy father's face looks up in yours when you see your own bright beauty springing up anew at your feet think now and then that there is a man who would give his life to keep a life you love beside you he said farewell said at last god bless you and left her end of book two chapter thirteen